section twenty seven of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter nine caesar part three to give a detailed account of the eight marvellous campaigns which laid gaul at the feet of the great proconsul does not fall within the scope of our task we are concerned with the character of caesar as man and as general rather than with the annals of his battles and sieges in the main we must draw our conception of his work in gaul from his own commentaries what information we get from other sources is comparatively unimportant the book was published with a political object probably it was written in haste during the year b c fifty as a vindication and advertisement of the author's doings before the eyes of the roman public yet it compares favourably with most works issued with such a purpose it is reticent and business-like there is little self-laudation the greatness of the author's achievements is not dinned into the reader's ears but allowed to speak for itself moreover it is difficult to detect in the commentaries any very serious tampering with facts they give of course caesar's own view of his wars but they seem as little marred by a desire to hide reverses or to exaggerate successes as those of any other commander who has ever written the narrative of his own campaigns the general result of the war speaks for itself it is sufficient to look at the roman boundary in b c fifty eight and to compare it with that of b c fifty in order to see that the main result of caesar's activity was much what he claimed if minor checks are sometimes glossed over the final triumph was indubitably complete it can have been no ordinary conqueror who not merely subdued gaul but left it behind him so thoroughly tamed that during the subsequent civil war the once turbulent tribes made no serious attempt to rise and to rid themselves of the wholly inadequate garrison which had been left to hold them down there are many things which combine to make the conquest of gaul a less formidable undertaking than it appeared at the first glance if numerous and warlike the celtic tribes were fickle and faction-ridden a real national sentiment existed but there were other sentiments which were stronger wherever caesar went he found communities which were ready to join him in suppressing their neighbours either because of ancestral feuds or because of the self-interest of the moment gaul in the first century before christ was much like the highlands of scotland in the seventeenth or eighteenth century after christ it sufficed that one clan should espouse one rival cause and its neighbour out of ancient jealousy would take up the other a power intervening from outside would be certain of support from all the enemies of the dominant tribe or chief of the moment it has been truly said that caesar subdued gaul by the arms of gauls just as clive and wellesley subdued india by the arms of indians in each case the conqueror had a strong nucleus of national troops in his host but they would not have sufficed for his task if they had not been supported by thousands of local auxiliaries moreover in each case powerful native states backed the invader the Aedui and the Remi stood to Caesar in Gaul, much as the Nawabs of Awud and the Carnatic stood to the British in India. Nor was it merely intertribal feuds that made the foreigners' work easy. The factions within the several communities were almost as fiercely opposed and as disloyal to the common weal as the states in general were disloyal to the national cause of Gaul a great proportion of the clans were torn to pieces by feuds between some predominant chief who aimed at regal power and the rest of the local oligarchy if the would-be tyrant was a nationalist the lesser chiefs called in caesar to help them if the oligarchs were nationalists it was their ambitious rival who made the appeal hence came the futility of the resistance of the gauls to the great proconsul they were always betraying each other the individual sacrificing the tribe the tribe the nation so much we gather from caesar's own works to the numerous instances which he gives there must have been many more to be added of which we have no knowledge every one of caesar's victories military or diplomatic was probably aided by local feuds and jealousies 
which an intelligent Gallic witness could easily have explained, but which are omitted in the pages of the commentaries, whose author could only give the situation as it appeared to himself, not as it appeared to his foes. This is the reason why Vercingetorix, a man of real genius, failed to hold together the patriotic confederacy which he had taken such pains to build up. An appeal to Gallic national feeling might rouse the tribes for a moment, but after a few months particularism resumed its sway. Each one of the confederates suspected the rest of doing less than their share, and then in sulky resentment resolved not to be exploited for the benefit of the neighboring states. It is certain, moreover, that the Gauls, even when they came together in the largest force, cannot have put in line the enormous armies of which the commentaries speak. It is always hard to calculate with accuracy the numbers of a tribal levée en masse. No doubt Caesar often doubled or trebled the real figures of the hosts that were opposed to him. The ancients had an even smaller power of estimating or realizing large numbers than the men of the present age, if we note the tendency among generals of to-day to swell the figures of savage hordes with whom they have had to deal, we need not doubt that Caesar was liable to the same failing. Every commander in such war states his own resources at a minimum, and sees those of the foe through a magnifying glass. No doubt the two hundred thousand swords of the Belgic army at the battle on the Aisne in B.C. 57 and the two hundred and fifty thousand men whom Vercassi Valaunus is said to have led to the relief of Alesia are wild and reckless estimates. Yet probably they represent the numbers which the Gauls believed that they had raised, and which the Romans believed that they had faced. There is no reason to think that Caesar invented them, or added extra thousands to the figures which were reported to him. The hordes were enormous. There was no certain method of counting them the conqueror cannot be much blamed for reproducing the current estimate nor can we expect him to point out another fact which was certainly a great advantage to him of the wild masses which formed the gallic tribal levies only a certain proportion were really formidable fighting men the horse was excellent the chiefs and their bands of sworn henchmen and debtors were gallant and desperate foes but the main body of the levée en masse must have consisted of half-armed husbandmen, like the English feared at Hastings. When the pugnacious and well-armed nobility and their retainers had been killed off in the forefront of the battle, there must have been little power to resist among the ill-equipped horde which formed the bulk of the tribal host. All this we state to explain Caesar's triumphs, not to diminish them. If these antecedent advantages had not existed, his task would have been impossible considering the very modest resources that were at his disposal. Even when all is conceded, the achievement remains marvellous. It was an intellectual and diplomatic triumph, quite as much as a mere series of successful campaigns, for it required even something more than a soldier of genius to carry the business through. Caesar fought with his brains, utilizing the unrivalled knowledge of human weakness and vanity which he had acquired during twenty years of political intrigue at rome no less than his military skill he discovered how to turn to account all the personal and tribal rivalries and jealousies of the gauls he knew how to buy and how to retain allies and auxiliaries he could be a powerful and liberal friend but he was also an awe-inspiring enemy for nothing is more striking in all his career than the way in which this affable and easy-going conqueror had recourse to massacre on the most vast and ruthless scale when he desired to strike terror into his adversaries the reader of the commentaries shudders at the callous fashion in which their author narrates his deeds of bloodshed done not from any feeling of honest resentment but out of cold-blooded policy the veneti had placed in bonds not murdered or tortured some roman officers whom caesar had sent into their territory for this offence when they had been attacked and conquered their whole senate was put to death and the rest of the tribe sold as slaves this is not the worst there are cases where caesar puts it on record that his army slew 
not only the fighting men of a conquered enemy but the aged the women the infants every living soul on other occasions he mutilated many thousands of prisoners by cutting off their right hands of the case of the uci petes and tank terry whose fate moved horror and compassion even among romans we have already had occasion to speak while dealing with the life of cato nothing can give a more sinister effect than caesar's own confession that he received their ambassadors who came to explain and apologize for a breach of truce put them in confinement and then marched without giving further notice against the unfortunate germans whom he surprised unarmed and cut to pieces to the number of four hundred and thirty thousand souls according to the account in the commentaries but the most repulsive of all caesar's acts of ruthlessness was one which has no parallel for long delayed and deliberate cruelty even in the dismal annals of the later republic when the gallant rebel vercingetorix freely surrendered at alesia to save the lives of his comrades caesar would have done nothing strange or improper if he had ordered him to be put to death on the spot the arvernian himself expected no less but for the conqueror to commit him to prison for six years and then to bring him out at his triumph parade him through the streets of rome and duly execute him in the tullianum shows a mixture of callousness and vanity for which no words of reproof are sufficiently hard after this caesar's admirers persist in telling us that he was naturally clement they point to the fact that during the civil war he very rarely put to death one of his captives and show that he pardoned some of the most irritating opponents when they fell into his hands remembering his awful doings in gaul we are driven to believe that his clemency was but a policy or a pose sulla had tried the method of proscriptions and it had been a failure warned by his experience caesar may have made up his mind to adopt the opposite policy in its most complete form the ides of march bear witness that this expedient also had its disadvantages augustus reverted to the methods of sulla but had the art to throw most of the odium on his colleague mark antony in the actual details of caesar's strategy and tactics in gaul there is much that is interesting at first sight they seem to involve some curious puzzles and contradictions on the one hand he was of all the great generals whom the world has seen the one who made the greatest use of the spade in a single campaign he would throw up more field entrenchments than napoleon or hannibal constructed in the whole of their military careers this tendency is usually the mark of a cautious commander and has for the most part gone along with slow movements small risks and a preference for the defensive but this same caesar who on some occasions stockaded himself up to the eyes and fortified every inch of ground that he covered blossomed out at other times into the most reckless ventures he would fly across the land with marches of almost incredible rapidity risk undertakings that combined the maximum of danger with the minimum of profit and stake his whole career on the most audacious strokes all in the style of charles the twelfth of sweden there is however no real incongruity in his actions it has only to be remembered that his final object was not so much the conquest of gaul as the building up for himself of an unrivalled military reputation and a devoted army his methods differed according to the necessities of the moment political as well as military and he was not the slave of any one system of tactics one does not associate him with any particular order of battle as we associate alexander with the advance in echelon with the cavalry leading or frederick the great with his famous oblique order or napoleon with the intense artillery preparation followed by a blow with heavy columns at one critical point of the adversary's line caesar was the least monotonous in his tactics of all the great generals whom the world has seen there is probably in this a trace of the fact that he was essentially an amateur of genius who had taken to war late in life and not a soldier steeped from his youth upwards in the study of the drill-book and the manoeuvres of the barrack-yard he worked by the inspiration of the moment 
rather than by the aid of the maxims of experience and the traditions of roman military art but speaking generally we may say that before he had thoroughly come to know the exact strength and value of his enemy and when no stake of vital importance was in question caesar was usually cautious in b c fifty eight while he was still new to his legions and while gaul and german were still known to him by repute only he used the spade with untiring energy and risked as little as he possibly could his first military act in gaul was to fortify lines of enormous length against the helvetii when he first met ariovistus he would not stir far from his camp and entrenched every point that he seized it was much the same when he made his earliest acquaintance with the belgi on the n he checkmated them by his impregnable position and held them at bay till they dispersed in the campaign about alesia in a similar way he executed field works of enormous length and magnitude making ditch and palisade serve in place of the numbers that were insufficient because he had not really the force required to perform the double operation of holding Vercingetorix blockaded and of keeping back the army of relief but even the Elysian circumvallation and contravallation seem small things compared with the interminable lines which caesar erected along the hills above Dyrrhachium during the campaign of b c forty eight when however caesar was driven into a corner or when he was forced to choose between compromising his reputation and career by a retreat and running a grave risk he repeatedly staked everything on a single blow there often arises a moment in war when a commander has to decide between a movement which will be ruinous if it fails but decisive of the whole campaign if it succeeds and another which is safe but indecisive a general who is fighting merely to defend a frontier or to hold an enemy in check naturally chooses the latter course but caesar who was aiming at establishing a reputation and winning a dominant position among his fellow countrymen often chose to accept the risk a thoroughly unsuccessful campaign even if accompanied with no crushing defeat would have lowered his prestige so much that his career would have been blighted he preferred rather to hazard everything on a bold stroke if he had failed he would probably have chosen not to survive the day but fortune was ever his friend and the possible disaster never came though it was often deserved caesar did not talk of his star though his friends invented one for him after his death but he had more reason to be grateful for unearned pieces of luck than any other great general in the world's history he might well have seen his career wrecked when he was surprised by the nervii on the sambre or when he was beset by overwhelming numbers on his march to samaro briva in b c fifty four or when the lines of alesia were all but pierced by the army of vercassi valaunus still nearer was the risk at Dyrrhachium, when before the arrival of his reinforcements he seemed doomed to inevitable destruction at alexandria the peril was quite as great and far more gratuitously incurred indeed the whole egyptian expedition was reckless almost beyond the bounds of sanity but fortune never failed caesar on the battlefield it seemed that he could not perish by the sword the dagger was his appointed doom in b c fifty gaul lay completely prostrate before the victor's feet for the first time he could turn his complete attention to roman politics without the fear of being distracted by some dangerous rebellion within his province this was the greatest of all caesar's strokes of luck for the breach with pompey in the senate was clearly at hand and every man of whom he could dispose would be wanted on the rubicon it passes our conception to guess what might have happened if vercingetorix had but delayed his great rising for two years and the general revolt of the gauls had occurred in b c fifty instead of in b c fifty two the declaration of open war by the optimate party might have reached caesar at the moment of some check like that which he suffered before gergovia or in the midst of a long protracted siege like that of alesia he could never have concentrated his army to march on italy it would have been completely tied up in the difficult gallic operations 
apparently the whole course of the world's history would have been changed if the arvernian chief had been a little more dilatory in his organization of the great national league but as things actually went caesar was as well prepared for the struggle as he could ever hope to be when the final crisis came his adversaries had even been good enough to supply him with a plausible casus belli and to refuse with contumely the many specious proposals for a pacification which he made to them that he had ever seriously intended that these proposals should be accepted it is hard to believe in return for a mere permission to stand in his absence for the consulship of b c forty eight he had offered to give up the transalpine province and eight of his legions if the optimates had accepted the terms he must either have found some excuse for drawing back from his plighted word or have been ruined by keeping it the only possible deduction seems to be that he was well aware that his enemies would refuse every offer however moderate which he might make to them his proposals therefore were only intended to influence public opinion and to cause cato pompey and his friends to appear in the character of the foes of a reasonable peace this was the actual result of the negotiations he was able to pose as a well-meaning citizen driven into war against his will and to claim that the passage of the rubicon was a mere act of self-defence his ingenious pleas will not stand examination least of all his solemn complaint that the optimates had violated the constitution by disregarding the vetoes of his friends the tribunes antony and cassius to any one who remembers how caesar himself had treated tribunes and their vetoes during his consulship in b c fifty nine it must appear ludicrous that he should urge this particular grievance against his adversaries we have already when dealing with the life of pompey explained the meaning of caesar's short and brilliant italian campaign he had seen that at this particular moment rapidity was the one chance of success without waiting even for his own main body to come up he had charged down into italy with headlong speed and struck his blow before the enemy could mobilize not only was he himself in his happiest vein but fortune was even more propitious than usual and his adversaries played into his hands the folly of domitius wrecked the last chance of the optimates and in the short nine weeks between december sixteenth b c fifty and february twentieth b c forty nine he had cleared the enemy out of the whole peninsula he had seized rome whose possession conferred a false air of legality on its master and at the same time he had occupied the whole recruiting ground where pompey had intended to raise those legions which were to start from the earth when he stamped his foot yet this was but the first act of the drama caesar's position was most precarious there was a widespread impression that his first success would be followed by massacres in the style of those by which marius and sulla had celebrated their capture of rome no one had forgotten that caesar's name had once been linked with that of catiline to cast a glance around the circle of his lieutenants was anything but reassuring assembled around him were all the notorious profligates and bankrupts of the day mark antony and curio caelius and dolabella vatinius and the rest they were a sinister crowd cicero called them the necuia the troop of vampires that any conqueror with such a past as caesar surrounded by such a gang of reprobates could be intending less than wholesale murder and confiscation seemed hardly possible it took a long time to convince the romans that they were not to expect red ruin and breaking up of laws and meanwhile public opinion would have welcomed the return of the respectable pompey even though his optimate friends were certain to make a clean sweep of the caesarians when they came back victorious it was necessary to strike a second blow as hard as the first had been if caesar was to retain what he had won if he lingered at rome the seven pompeian legions from spain would soon be heard of in the valley of the po and pompey himself the moment that he had collected a respectable army in epirus might descend from his ships on some unexpected point of the italian seaboard caesar had but two advantages the central position and the fact that he had a veteran army already mobilized while his foes were but drawing their levies together more than most generals he appreciated the value of time his one chance 
was to beat his adversaries in detail before they could combine even before they could get into communication and settle on a common plan of campaign it was certain that pompey could not be ready for many months on the other hand the army in spain was fit to move at once but was commanded by men whose measures caesar had taken long before commonplace soldiers without a stroke of genius hence came the dictator's determination to make a dash at spain in the spring with the hope of destroying or at least of defeating and disabling afranius and petraeus before pompey could assemble an army in epirus with which a general of his cautious character would dare to assault italy it was a most hazardous plan for if pompey had but risen to the occasion and cast off his methodical ways he would have found rome and italy weakly garrisoned against an attack but fortune was as usual in caesar's camp afranius and petraeus advanced almost to the foot of the pyrenees to meet him and allowed themselves to be outmanoeuvred beaten and taken prisoners at ilerda july second forty nine the pompeian army of spain was almost annihilated only in remote corners of the iberian peninsula did resistance linger on completely freed from the fear of an attack upon his rear by the pompeians of the west caesar could hurry back to italy to face the optimate army in epirus which was at last growing formidable in numbers and beginning to acquire a certain military value it mattered little to him that while he was victorious at ilerda his lieutenant curio had lost his life and his army while executing a daring but unlucky attack on the pompeians in africa the spanish business had been hazardous for all might have gone wrong for caesar if only his opponents had refused to fight him and had adopted guerrilla tactics after the fashion of sertorius had they refused to battle and withdrawn into the mountains with their forces intact caesar would have been left in a quandary if he pursued them and was drawn into a long campaign italy might well have been lost behind his back if on the other hand he had refused to commit himself to operations in the interior of spain and had gone back to italy with his reserves he could not have spared an army sufficient to hold back the pompeian generals they would have driven in any covering force that he might leave behind and have once more begun to threaten his rear but they fought and were annihilated again caesar had been granted the one stroke of fortune that could save him End of section 27。section 28 of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter 9 caesar part 4 yet caesar had to hurry from risk to risk if there had been dangerous possibilities in spain those which followed in epirus were still more threatening some of the dangers were of his own making nothing can excuse the recklessness with which he flung his troops across the sea before he had transports enough to carry them all at one voyage it was no doubt an advantage to be able to cross the straits before pompey's admirals who fancied that all armies must necessarily go into winter quarters in november had begun to suspect him of any such intention but the compensating disadvantage of being obliged to leave behind nearly half his army for want of shipping was greater the second division could not follow him when the optimate fleet proceeded to blockade brundisium caesar had to maintain himself in epirus with seven weak legions and a handful of cavalry for nearly three months by land the superior forces of pompey held him in check on the side of the sea he was watched by the squadron which cut his communication with italy it was a miracle that he was not destroyed it required all his good luck to aid his consummate generalship once he thought that even his luck had failed him this was on the occasion when he made his celebrated attempt to run across to italy in a small open boat in order to hurry up his reserves at any risk and at all costs he got out to sea but his sailors could not face the storm 
in spite of his well-known adjuration to them to fear nothing for they carried caesar and his fortunes the vessel was beaten back to shore and the great general had to stave off apparently inevitable disaster for some weeks more till in the middle of february antony at last succeeded in eluding the pompeian fleet and coming over to epirus how nearly the squadron of the future triumvir came to disaster we have told in an earlier chapter but after suffering the extreme of peril he reached epirus and joined his master even then the game was not won there followed the long and well-contested struggle at the lines in front of Durachium, the most wonderful piece of spade work in the wars of the ancient world modern history has nothing to compare to it except the long contest in eighteen sixty four and five between grant and lee in their interminable entrenchments around richmond and petersburg which stretched out to even greater length than those of caesar and pompey but the struggle in epirus differed in one extraordinary point from the struggle in virginia here it was the general with the smaller veteran army who tried to enclose his opponent by running field works round his flanks and reducing him to starvation even caesar could not carry out such an astonishing plan he failed with heavy loss and pompey broke loose and seemed for a moment victorious it was perhaps the greatest of all caesar's military achievements that he succeeded in drawing off from his shattered lines without a fatal disaster but the moment must have been a bitter one to him it was his first defeat on a large scale and it was hard to see how it could be retrieved he had no base on which to retreat he had no large reinforcements to expect he was still cut off from italy by the pompeian fleet the sudden march into thessaly with which he ended the campaign round Dorachium must have been the council of despair if pompey failed to follow him into the interior and chose instead to ship himself over into undefended italy the game was lost caesar had no fleet in which to follow his rival and it would have profited him little to take thessalonica or to ravage greece but once more fortune came to the aid of the great adventurer pompey refused to make the bold stroke and to sail for italy he followed his enemy across the mountains and offered him battle at pharsalus ruined by the misbehaviour of his numerous cavalry with which he had hoped to ride down the gallic legions he saw his army break and fly and rode off the field a ruined man pharsalus made caesar master of the world the game was at last in his hands and he had but to hunt down the scattered remnants of the pompeian party who maintained a hopeless resistance in the remoter provinces that the civil war lingered on for another three years was due not so much to the truly roman obstinacy of the surviving optimates as to caesar's inexplicable divagation to egypt there was no need to chase the forlorn little band which followed pompey down to the mouth of the nile but if the enterprise were taken in hand it was foolhardy to set out with but one single legion the east might have been safely neglected for the present the real objective for the caesarian host was africa the one region where the enemy had still a considerable force under arms if the victor of pharsalus had started at once to deal with scipio and king juba he might easily have finished the war ere the year b c forty eight was out five months of the summer and autumn were still before him and the news of pompey's hopeless disaster had struck terror into his foes but caesar chose to go off to egypt where he was busy for eight precious months on a trifling and unnecessary task which became difficult and dangerous mainly because he essayed it with wholly inadequate resources if he had taken three legions instead of one to alexandria there would have been no egyptian war the whole episode is unworthy of caesar the conqueror of gaul should not have placed himself in the position to be besieged for months by a levantine rabble and saved by an oriental condottiere like mithridates of pergamus 
still less should he have lapsed into his silly and undignified entanglement with cleopatra it was his alexandrian dangers and dalliance which allowed his adversaries in the west and south to recover their spirits and rally their armies if he had sailed for africa in august b c forty eight thapsus would have been fought eighteen months sooner and munda would never have been fought at all for southern spain only slipped out of caesar's hands after pharsalus had been won and if africa had been reduced in the autumn of b c forty eight the two sons of pompey would never have had their chance of recovering baetica and rallying all the last desperate adherents of their father's cause for one final stand in the west caesar owed it entirely to his own carelessness that he was nearly beaten by boys at munda whereas he had to confess for the first time in his life he was forced to fight not for victory but for his bare life in short it must be owned that during the latter years of the civil war caesar as tactician was as great as ever but caesar as political strategist was reckless and overweening he seems to have grown so confident in his own skill and luck that he did not take the trouble to use common precautions to turn all his strength to account or to take his enemy seriously indeed after Durachium and pharsalus all should have been child's play to him if it was not the fault lay with himself but at last after munda his crowning mercy as cromwell would have called it caesar found no more enemies to subdue and made his final return to rome he set out for the city in july b c forty five he was only destined to survive till the ides of march b c forty four of caesar as soldier we have said enough it only remains to consider him as the master of the world and the founder of the imperial system what are we to make of the few months of supreme power during which he was at last settled down in the city and laying the foundation for a permanent settlement of the roman world suetonius and plutarch have preserved for us a large number of details concerning his civil activity in these months one thing is undoubted it was pure autocracy and no mere modification of the republican constitution that he intended to introduce unlike sulla whose career was in so many ways the antitype of his own caesar had fought and conquered not for his party but for himself there was in fact no longer a democratic party the very name of party implies the existence of a body of persons who agree to act together for some common political end but the caesarians were nothing of this sort they were simply the hired servants of the dictator who humbly carried out his orders without any attempt to criticize or to understand them the one man of the faction who showed a spirit of his own perished miserably this was the headstrong caelius rufus who against his employer's orders raised an old democratic cry no why tabulae the abolition of debts and tried to carry out some of the anarchic designs which had been dear to catiline caesar was absent from rome himself but his agents saw to the suppression of caelius he was deposed from his praetorship whereupon he fled into the south of italy and raised bands of slaves and debtors in the true catilinarian style enlisting as his lieutenant the old optimate bravo milo the rebellion proved a fiasco and the rebels were destroyed by a regiment of gallic horse those who had joined caesar in the mere hope of plunder and proscriptions were thus warned that it was their master's programme not their own that was to be carried out those on the other hand who remained faithful to him were rewarded by huge gifts of money and estates sufficient to pay off all their debts but they were not indulged with the noai tabulae which would have frightened the equestrian order and all the capitalists whom the dictator was anxious to conciliate however disappointed they may have been at seeing that they were to be the well-paid hirelings of their leader and not his colleagues or counsellors the caesarian gang had to accept the position a vast amount of praise has been bestowed upon caesar for introducing good and firm government into italy when it had been expected 
that his triumph would be followed by plunder and proscriptions but it is only a savage or a man who has injuries to avenge who would deliberately choose to slay those whom he might safely spare or to destroy riches which he might safely utilize caesar was not in the position of marius or sulla he had not been hunted round italy by his foes like the former nor did he return to find rome red with the blood of his friends like the latter he had taken the city almost before a blow had been struck in the civil war and had no tangible injuries to avenge the hustling of his tribunes and his own outlawing would hardly have been made a convincing excuse for a general massacre indeed the leading optimates had evacuated rome and it would have been on men of small importance or on moderates like cicero that a proscription must have fallen again a general confiscation of property would have thrown rome and italy into chaos and bankruptcy but caesar wished to have as much money at his disposal as possible for the equipment of the great armies that he was raising clearly from the most selfish point of view it was wiser for him not to throw the financial world into a crisis and thereby to make enemies of all the capitalists who had not retired in the company of pompey there is no need to praise the magnanimity of one who acts from enlightened self-interest and this would appear to have been the case with caesar so it is also with his good government both in italy and in the provinces when once he had established his domination it was to his advantage that he should rule over a wealthy and contented rather than over a poor and disloyal empire there is this difference between the rule of an autocrat and that of an oligarchy that in the first case the ruler's individual gain is best secured by the prosperity of his subjects while in the second the personal interest of each member of the oligarchy may lead him to feather his nest to the grave detriment of the state because his legitimate share of the profits of empire is comparatively a small one it was in rome in caesar's day much as it was in france in the day of bonaparte the directory whom the corsican superseded were infinitely worse rulers than he because their personal interest did not like his coincide with the interest of the majority of the french people the change was undoubtedly beneficial to the country at large yet we do not therefore regard bonaparte as entitled to an enthusiastic moral approval any despot who is not a lunatic will adopt the same programme so far as he is able this being understood we may grant that the practical benefits conferred by caesar alike on the city and the empire were enormous if he had done nothing more than put an end to the turbulence of the roman streets by the institution of his praefectus urbi backed by armed cohorts it would have been a considerable boon it was something that he cut down the number of the recipients of the corn dole though since he had posed as a democrat he could not abolish it altogether still better was to persuade as many of the citizens as possible to go forth to transmarine colonies but any successful despot must have taken all these measures to keep an armed force in the capital to endeavour to distract the energies of the multitude into colonization were devices as old as periander and dionysius as to the settlements inside the peninsula which caesar planned out for his veterans they do not seem to have been much more successful than the earlier attempts of the democrats agriculture in italy south of the rubicon was ruined beyond redemption as to the legislation concerning debt and luxury which the dictator introduced we cannot take it very seriously it was a case of satan rebuking sin his own licentious extravagance in his youth and the astounding loads of indebtedness which he had contracted prevented him from attacking the problem with any moral weight no man can be made good by act of parliament still less by the rescript of an autocrat a moral reformation in the governing classes of the state was the only possible road to reform and the caesar was not the man to start such a movement bad as was the general tone of the roman aristocracy in the first century b c it was to be worse in the first century a d servility to the omnipotent emperor was added to the other vices which they had previously displayed 
in short the caesarian laws were palliatives for the moment they had no ameliorating force for the future in the provinces there can be no doubt that the new monarchy was far more effective and benevolent than in the city the fact that the governors were made responsible to a wary autocrat instead of to corrupt law courts and a feeble senate improved the lot of the subjects of rome to an incalculable extent it was to caesar's interest that the provincials should be wealthy and contented and therefore the oppressive governor and the swindling publicanus had to be kept in check and punished the dictator did not himself live long enough to set the centralized system in proper working order but the mere fact that he had established a monarchy made the improvement inevitable the reforms of augustus were but the necessary corollary of his great uncle's triumph it was the same with the internal organization of the empire caesar wished to rule willing rather than disloyal subjects hence came his endeavours to encourage municipal patriotism to open a roman career to prominent provincials he even made senators of many gauls and spaniards to develop new towns and to strengthen old ones by his numerous colonies all and more than all that he had planned was carried out by augustus and the first century of the empire was undoubtedly a period of material prosperity in the mediterranean lands such as had never been known in the days of the republican regime but it must be remembered that it was purely material caesar could give no moral impulse to the world the empire was a time of lost ideals because its founder was himself a man who had lived down or had never possessed any governing enthusiasm save that of personal ambition nations like men need an aim and an ideal to keep them sound the mere enjoyment of good administrative government is wholly inadequate to create or preserve real moral energy and it is hard to see what the roman of the empire which caesar created had to live for religion could not help him indeed it barely existed caesar himself was a sceptic his great nephew equally irreligious at heart served out to his subjects the archaistic revival of old ceremonial worship and the hollow cult of divus julius in neither of them was there the least breath of reality the only moral force that existed for the subjects of the empire was the stoic philosophy which influenced but a few choice spirits and at the best was but a council of despair to keep the soul free and unpolluted if the body was doomed to servitude and misery it was a philosophy for the individual not for the state its ground idea was that the times were evil and that the good man could do no more than preserve his own self-respect in an empire which pretended to have restored the golden age the holding of such views was almost treasonable in itself where neither religion nor philosophy can serve to maintain a healthy spirit and a moral basis for society a vigorous national patriotism has sometimes served as a substitute but the empire destroyed patriotism it was cosmopolitan in its tendencies and swamped the narrow but very real devotion to the city which had been the main source of the strength of the earlier republic patriotism needs stress and adversity to develop its best features it almost presupposes that the state has dangerous enemies and aspirations that have yet to be fulfilled but under the empire the romans absorbed all their old neighbours and foes syrian and spaniard britain and numidian were all made romans of a sort there was no peril from the external barbarian for two hundred years the parthian empire was slowly dwindling in strength the germans had not yet learned to combine they might perhaps check an invading army but they could be no serious danger to the state in short there was no adequate object against which the patriotic impulse could be directed and it gradually dwindled away into a vague and unfruitful pride when external matters at last became serious in the third century after christ there is no trace whatever of any sense of national duty among the heterogeneous romans of the day the bureaucracy which the empire had bred and the professional army had to face the storm from the north 
without any support from the indifferent masses. What more could they have hoped when the individual citizen was debarred from politics and invited to entrust all his cares to the divine autocrat who had superseded the Senate and people? Caesar, in short, put an end to urban sedition and provincial misgovernment, but he and his great nephew gave the world instead of its old anarchy a period of mere soulless material prosperity if the barbarians had never resumed the attack from without if christianity had never arisen to give new ideals from within the roman empire would have gradually sunk into a self-satisfied stationary civilization of the chinese type whether it be considered as a despotism or a bureaucracy it was a magnificent failure already by the end of the second century before the german attack grew dangerous it had lapsed into moral and physical impotence on the civil side it was over-governed and overtaxed. on the military side it had developed a denationalized army which had begun to sell the diadem to the highest bidder it is hardly necessary to recall the fact that between the death of commodus and the accession of diocletian a period of no more than ninety years some thirty emperors not to speak of unrecognized usurpers and tyrants came to violent ends at the hands of their own soldiery the first caesar had taken the sword a clear majority of his successors perished by the sword what julius himself intended to make of the empire we can but guess he was cut off before he had made his intentions clear his plans we cannot doubt were still in the process of development when he was cut off by the hands of brutus and cassius he had enjoyed less than a year of complete sovereignty and was still in the stage of trying experiments probably he designed to take the name of king probably he intended to make his power hereditary for he had adopted his great nephew octavian and had begun to train him as his heir and successor he was dealing with senate and people in the true vein of the autocrat to the one he was issuing undisguised commands the other he was beginning to ignore as a factor in the constitution probably his heir had read his intentions and we may interpret the plan of julius by its execution under augustus the dictator was always an opportunist who watched the times with a wary eye he had withdrawn his first tentative grasp at the diadem and was still wearing the imperator's laurel wreath when he perished but there can be little doubt that his purpose was deferred and not renounced he had still far to go when the daggers of the conspirators intervened and restored for a short space the anarchy which they called liberty yet if his work was not complete he had at least done so much that the republic could never be restored he had worked out to its logical end the movement which tiberius gracchus had begun which marius had continued which sulla had vainly striven to stem and which pompey had unwittingly furthered the problem of sovereignty had been solved neither senate nor people could rule the empire and the inevitable autocrat had taken over the powers which they had abused whither autocracy would lead neither he nor any of his contemporaries could have foreseen a new chapter in the world's history had been begun but no more than its opening lines had been written when the great dictator perished on the fatal ides of march end of section twenty eight recording by pamela nagami in encino california august two thousand and eighteen end of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman